the details, but you know, we're working as well. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, welcome to our third out of four archaeology talks this semester. I will remind you we have one final uh, Wednesday talk uh, in a regular schedule that's coming up on April 5th. Uh, no, May 5th. May 5th, which is the final week of classes, right after the end of class. Um, we also have a very special um, pair of events on Wednesday and Thursday next week, so look for the flyers about those. The Wednesday event will be here from noon to 1.30, and the Thursday event will be over at the Park D School, and those are with Tess Davis, uh, an alum of BU, and uh, somebody's really influential in thinking about global antiquities trafficking. So if you're interested in that, that is uh, next week here on Wednesday, and then uh, panel discussion on Thursday of our party. Um, today, however, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Eric Johnson from Brown University. So Eric is uh, somebody I've actually known for a long time. Uh, he is a scholar of a variety of different types of historical archaeology, which is one of, I think, the most interesting things about your scholarship. So he's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the history, the Department of the History of Art and Architecture. Yes. The COVID Center for the, the Center Institute for the Humanities? Uh, Institute. Institute yes. for the Humanities <laughs> and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative at Brown University, um, where he is working on a really exciting project that we were just chatting about earlier on stone landscapes in the Northeastern United States. Uh, indigenous stone landscapes, but that is not what he'll be talking to us about today. Instead, he'll be talking about his doctoral work, which is also based primarily in New Jersey, and um, looks at a different period of colonial interaction with indigenous communities. Prior to this, uh, he was a doctoral student at Harvard University, and before that, a master student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he worked primarily in Icelandic archaeology, a very different historical period. Um, and so, again, uh, not what he'll be talking about today, but again, why we wanted him to have the opportunity to hang out with some of you afterwards, because you can ask him questions about any of those topics and more. So, without further ado, let me turn things over to Eric to discuss for us an archaeology of settler capitalism. Thank you, Mac, uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. This is uh, really a, a pleasure. I've only been here once before, but I've had been in Boston, at Harvard, and at UMass. Like I, I've always had uh, connections and social networks that have intersected with BU, uh, and so it's, it's really my pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so, as, as, uh, as Mac said, I have a lot of different research interests. But what I'm going to present on right now is based off of my dissertation, which I wrapped up in 2021. And uh, for those of you who are working on a dissertation or have maybe finished a dissertation in the past, it's always good, I would say, after you've finished, to take a step back and to let it sit, <laughs> to let it uh, put it on ice and let yourself have some space and some time to reflect on it and then come back to it with fresh eyes. And that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be presenting the, the archaeological analysis and results of the field work that I did in New Jersey. But I'm beginning to frame these, this data in a new way, for, in a, with a new type of theoretical framework. So in many ways, this is a, I'm kind of experimenting with all of you today. So if anyone has any ideas or suggestions or critiques, I'm more than welcome to talk about that. Um, but yes, this is, for me, one example of what I'm referring to as settler capitalism. Uh, and if you note, it's a bit of a portmanteau and a neologism all at once between uh, settler colonialism and capitalism. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And we can debate, of course, the strengths and weaknesses of neologisms in, in, in academia in general. But before I do that, I want to mention that the work took place in what is today northern New Jersey. And as you see here, this whole area is part of the uh, Lenape indigenous land, 
but of course, if they're in the Napa indigenous homelands. Uh, but there are also different subgroups of like what anthropologists have called Lenape. Uh, and the northern part, which is where today New Jersey is specifically Munsi Lenape territory. And of course, there are a lot of different Munsi descendant communities that exist. But one of those, the one that I have worked with most closely, and that also is part of my future research project, is the Ramapo Lenape Nation. Of, uh, they are a state-recognized tribe of New Jersey, so they're not federally recognized, uh, but they are living in, their community has lived in and around the, uh, the Ramapo Mountains um, since the time of colonial dispossessions, um, and have remained in that area since then, have their own kind of divergent history from other Muncie descendant nations. But, um, I bring this up both to acknowledge, of course, that this takes place on you know, indigenous land, uh, but I also note that in my conversations with, uh, in particular, Chief Man of the Turtle Clan of the Ramapo, um, this project is not a collaborative indigenous project in the traditional sense, but some of the ideas that I'm going to be talking about are informed by my conversations uh, with members of the Turtle Clan here. So when it comes to thinking about what is wampum, what does it mean uh, for, this, for this area? If you don't know what wampum is, I'll explain in a second. Um, and also in thinking about the darker side of industrialization uh, and, and capitalism. So if you'll notice, this image is actually a, a meeting that took place between Vincent Mann and Mayor Keith Mishagna of uh, the borough of Park Ridge. And this is at a location where we were about to start excavating. Uh, and Chief Man came to uh, do a, a blessing of the site before breaking ground. And, and also was a chance, because it was public owned, or owned by the town of Park Ridge, also a chance to engage with uh, Mayor Mishagna in a new political, uh, a kind of new political recognition that didn't exist before. And in that meeting, he brought with him what's known as a, a wampum belt. So I'm going to now shift to the 19th century, shift to the 18th century. But this is all to show that, of course, uh, the themes that I'm talking about, wampum diplomacy, industrialization, et cetera, uh, are all also active today. That wampum is still in use today, and it is still like used to form political uh, recognition and different types of political relationships. So. I mean, this is going to be structured into four parts. I'm going to do a brief preamble, theoretical preamble, about what settler capitalism is and what, how we can look at it materially. And then I'm going to tell a story in two parts, which is first a cottage industry, and then part two, or part three here, is, in, is when that industry becomes industrialized in the 19th century. And then I'm going to go through my the actual archaeological analysis and results. There's another part of this project that I'm not talking about, which will be part of a larger book project, and that is where these beads, I'm talking about beads today, if you haven't picked that up. But while this, the last part of this work is where the beads end up after being produced in New Jersey. Um, I don't have time to talk about that today, but it is part of the overall project. So, materialities of settler capitalism, or Assemblages of appropriation. So this project began largely um, by finding, by, by encountering a site, and that site made me think about things that I that I hadn't thought about before. Uh, I'm mostly, as an academic, interested in capitalism, histories of capitalism as a material process. Um, but the site that I'm going to talk about today is a, is, a, is a site that makes clear the fact that ca the history of capitalism is deeply interwoven also with the history of settler colonialism. And it's hard, in especially in North America, to talk about one without talking about the other. But there are uh, also different bodies of literature, theoretical literature, that theorize what settler colonialism is versus theorizing the archaeology of capitalism. So I've been trying to find ways to bridge these theoretical frameworks and one of the words that I found that pops up in both of these literatures is the word appropriation. So to just think briefly about what appropriation is, it derives from the concept of property, or especially private property, 
uh, in the kind of Lockean tradition of, of, of uh, political theory and political economy. But property, when we think about this as, as a century or more of anthropological research has shown, it's, it's itself a static concept. It's a, is it property or not, right? But in reality, making private property requires a kind of practice, a kind of, it's, it's a process. And that's why appropriation is such a, a powerful word when thinking about either uh, theories of capitalism or settler colonialism, because it is the act of making one's own. It's an action. And that action is also related to a material uh, process. So as I surveyed these literatures, I just started to make a list of way, places in which the word appropriation appears. And we have on the one side Marxist anthropology, or even you know, old materialist ways of thinking about Marxism. And that is, Marx refers to, uses the word appropriation to talk about nature or what he refers to the metabolic interaction of, of man and nature, where, where one goes out into the, quote, natural world and appropriates those resources and mixes labor with that process to create commodities, et cetera. Um, that's, of course, been critiqued by indigenous scholars specifically from critical indigenous studies. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the other use of the word appropriation comes in particular and the the notion of appropriating surplus value. And I think it matters that the same word is being used here to describe the dynamics of wage labor and the dynamics of, of, of man and the quote man and its relationship to the environment. Um, on the other hand, we have the field of critical indigenous studies, which mostly focuses on the, the use of the word appropriation when it comes to cultural appropriation. That is, making one's own of cultural, whether that's linguistic or symbolic or material forms, and then and incorporating them into sort of settler forms of identity or, or et cetera. Some scholars have theorized archaeology itself as a kind of appropriation, cultural appropriation. And then lastly, I don't have much time to talk about it, but also when it comes to politics, uh, I, I think about the ways that settler states uh, misappropriate recognizing what indigenous politics is. Um, you can ask me that about that in the Q&A if you'd like. But the nice thing is that both of these fields have used the word appropriation to talk about land, or in particular expropriation, the taking away of land from uh, certain groups of people. And the, the literature that I'm most interested in actually comes from both critical indigenous studies and in uh, the field of history which is like theorizing the history of North America in ways that incorporate both Marxist concepts and critical indigenous studies concepts. So here's a few kind of inspirations along those lines. So when it comes to settler capitalism, we can think about this from as a series of appropriations, appropriating, quote, nature. And I'm rethinking this in part inspired by indigenous uh, studies scholars, not just to think about the environment as a static kind of set of use values, but as uh, as persons, potentially, right? Uh, so that comes both in thinking about histories of enslavement, appropriating persons as, as property, uh, but also thinking about um, what we typically call resources, whether those are trees that become lumber, or in the case of this project, conch shell that becomes beads. Um, and of course, appropriating land, which is pretty straightforward. But of course, the, we also have to think about how it is that that land is appropriated, also as a material process. Uh, culture, et cetera, uh, in terms of replacement, and also the possessing of that culture by a settler society, uh, politics of recognition, et cetera, labor. I've walked through some of these already. I don't want to spend too much time uh, on this. But this are kind of, this at the moment, how I'm structuring the book that may result from this work. Um, for archaeologists, how do we study this as a material process, right? Both theoretically and then also, yeah, met you know, methodologically. Uh, and so from a theoretical perspective, I'm inspired a bit, at least, by new materialism. Um, ways of thinking about assemblages, where different material forms sort of come together and then act, or come together as part of an action of appropriation. Um, 
But I also am a little bit more on the old materialist side of things to, to, to not uh, to make sure that we acknowledge human agency in that process, right? There, there are definitely human intentions that go behind using objects. And that's why in this project I've been thinking about shell as a conscript. So it is conscripted into a regime of capitalism and settler colonialism um, in a way that it doesn't, it was, you know, it's not volunteering, right? It's, it's, it's a certain kind of agency here that we need to specify. Um, and that, but the nice thing about a conscript is that it doesn't necessarily have a choice, but it can also defect. Uh, again, not necessarily thinking about intentionally defecting, but I, I'm interested in the defect part, the defect core of that word defection, to suggest that Shell, especially when it comes to production, has... In the, as we'll see later in the talk, uh, oftentimes defects from a project of industrialization by breaking or not being suitable for a certain purpose. And so keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. Shell as both a conscript and a defector. These are the main three things that I'm going to be talking about. The other two, land and politics of recognition, I don't have time to talk about. But now let's move into the actual narrative here. So, as I said at the beginning, Chief Mann brought with him a wampum belt to his meeting with the Park Ridge mayor. Um, and for those who don't know, wampum, well, it is a different thing depending on who you ask. If you ask an archaeologist, you know, they might respond by just giving you a material description. This is a purple or white tubular marine shell bead that's beads made from marine mollusks. Um, and if you're familiar with the 17th century fur trade history, you also are probably familiar with its economic associations. It becomes, in the 17th century, a currency of a sort for Europeans, a colonial currency, not necessarily a strict currency in, when it's in indigenous hands. Uh, but, a, but it's much more than just its economic dimensions. It also has sacred dimensions. When we're thinking about uses for native people, it has sacred associations, it has social importance, it has political, particularly political importance as we can see in this belt, uh, which is, was originally commissioned by U.S. President George Washington for the Haudenosaunee uh, in 1794 to commemorate uh, a political, more or less a political treaty. It becomes, when it's woven into these belts, it signifies certain rights of access and political agreements, and these belts are, in port, of course, used today. Now, the beads themselves, uh, in the 17th century and before and after, uh, but for this period of, 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 in the colonial period, they're mostly produced by native nations of southern New England, whether that's Narragansett, Wampanoag, Pequot, or the many nations of Long Island. And the Long Island Sound area is where most of these beads were being produced and then exchanged with other nations uh, for the West and the Great Lakes region. But my project actually examines after the 17th century when Euro-Americans <coughs> begin to appropriate the production of these beads. So this is a story of, for lack of a better term, white people making wampum, or at least that's how this story began. <clears throat> so when we think about appropriating wampum making, this is of course appropriation of culture, of craft, Right, it's something that still happens today, uh, with uh, in thinking about intellectual property law and who has the right to make something that is indigenous or sell something that is indigenous made, for instance. Um, but for me, uh, this is also this is, this is also a, a representation of this intersection between settler colonialism and capitalism. That is. I, I see that there's a link here between competitive market ideology, right, like competing with certain people to make certain goods and to produce them faster or differently, uh, and the logics of elimination. I'll put up a quote here that kind of summarizes this. And this is quote that I'm about to show is from the owner and operator of a wampum factory in the late 19th century. So. This is the Campbell Wampum Factory, and the interview with this owner says, you see, the Indians had all the time they wanted and no tools to speak of. 
And they would grind away for a month on a little piece of shell and finally turn out a good bit of work. But it was, slow, it was a slow way to coin money, though the money was good enough when it was coined. So great-grandfather, that is this Campbell, uh, this Campbell factory owner, his great-grandfather, went to work and found he could beat the native methods away out of sight. So for me, this quote shows that cultural appropriation of the craft of bead making is also blending with logics of capitalist competition and therefore also blending the logic of elimination with that market ideology. So how did this factory come about? Well, the story begins, in fact, not in New Jersey, but in the Caribbean, specifically in, uh, at least in this case, in this example I'm about to talk about here in St. Croix. Uh, of course, St. Croix has like, a long history of colonial interactions with both the Dutch and the English. Um, but in the 18th and 19th century, it was also the primary place where settlers began to uh, start a commodity chain of conch shell. I should say, this is actually important here, of these purple and white beads, originally they were made by a marine shell that's local to the New England, uh, to the southern New England area, the Long Island Sound. So that's purple beads made from quahog shell and white beads made from whelk. Um, so those materials in the 17th century are coming locally, but by the 18th century, the raw material for bead making is coming from the Caribbean. And we know this because we have a, a letter that says that uh, from a merchant in New York to a man named James Campbell in the Pascac Valley that he's selling 2,000 conch shells and they're fresh from the sea, uh, bought them off the divers, off their boats, uh, and this, they're going from the Caribbean to New York and then to New Jersey from there. And the, probably the harvesters here are actually, and we don't know for sure in this letter who the divers are, but there is definitely a history of Afro-Caribbean divers and their specialty in being able to like dive deeply to the bottom floor. I mean, it's a hazardous type of work as well, but uh, the, they're known for their skill in harvesting pearls and other, other mollusk uh, species from the sea floor at this time. So it's likely that there's also an Afro-Caribbean piece of this story. Nevertheless, at the, uh, at, at, in that letter, we can see that the shells end up in New York and eventually to Bergen County, specifically the Pascack Valley area here, which you can see the New York skyline from the region. So here is a historic map of that same area, the Pascack Valley here, Bergen County. And on the left, you can also see a few bits of that conch that, uh, that uh, I recovered from a property in the area. So just a few places here to contextualize. The Campbell factory that we heard of before was located about here. The, I'm going to then also talk about the Demarest store, which is located there, and the David Campbell house, which is located in the northern Pascac Valley. So the reason I bring up these three places is because we can see in merchant ledgers that David Campbell, this is a kind of illustration of the microeconomy of bead making at this time. So David Campbell, he goes to the store in 1844 and he's buying tobacco and dishes and things like that, but he's also buying 25 conch shells. It's spelled with a K, but it's, it's more or less um, pretty interpret, easy to interpret there uh, for a certain, you know, eight, uh, pound shillings, eight shillings. Uh, and then he's also bringing with him uh, it's misspelled a bit or spelled differently here, but wampum. And wampum in, is also in the credit line of the credit debit uh, ledgers here. So he's actually using wampum to pay for some of the goods that he purchases. He comes back a month later with 12,000 wampum beads uh, and pays the rest of his debts that way. So there we can start to get some estimates on how quickly these beads are being produced. And luckily, uh, the house where David Campbell lived in the mid-19th mid century is still more or less standing today. It's just a suburban landscape, and the owner of this property was kind enough to let us uh, wander on, onto, their, onto their lot. And I could see immediately from the, uh, especially the garden areas, there's uh, bits of shell that were scattered across the whole property. So it's a very clear relationship between the uh, historic documentary record 
and the archaeological record here. So we did a couple of years of excavations, and here's some of the uh, sort of map of the distribution of different shell at the site. It was a beautiful place to work, uh, one of the most pleasant sites I've ever worked at, that's for sure. Um, and on the left, you can see a distribution map of shell at the site. White being more shell, and the darker areas being less shell. The X's being shell test pits, and then the squares being actual excavation units. So we tried to sample from different, get a representative sample from different locations at the site of different shell debris. And we didn't just find shell, but we also found a household assemblage that are kind of classic to archaeological, historical archaeological research here. Uh, and what's nice about these uh, ceramics in particular is that we're able to date them that exist, the date to the, date the ceramics that exist contemporaneously with the shell to figure out when was this shell actually worked. Um, and that aligns almost precisely with the um, property records that we know from the site, and that is from 1810 to 1850, more or less. So what was David Campbell and his family doing with these conch shells when they arrived at his house? Well, there's a few steps to uh, making shell beads, at least in this context. Um, and the first step is, of course, to take its reduction, more or less. Right? We're, most of us are archaeologists here, right? So we think about how like, stone tools are made. It's a very similar process. You take a whole shell, you break it up into smaller pieces, and then shave it down into a, a tubular shape. Uh, and then, uh, actually, these are reversed. That's actually the, the last step here, the final polishing with a foot-powered grinding wheel. But before that, actually, you would have to drill the bead. Uh, and this image is accurate, more or less, because uh, it, in the sense that we know that women were the primary produce, primary one of the primary producers of shell beads at this time. Uh, drilling took it was done with a bow drill um, that's illustrated here. That you press it up against the breastplate. Um, we know this both from oral histories and then there are also uh, uh, existing examples of these artifacts. But yeah, uh, a an economic survey of the region from 1846 said that wampum has been manufactured by females in this region from very early times for the Indians. And the other thing to note here is that drilling at this time was a really difficult part of that process, um, but also performed with rapidity and grace that is interesting to witness. So these interviewers are impressed by the skill that these women have when they're actually drilling. So again, when we think about David Campbell's name in the ledger, it's not David Campbell himself, per se, that's doing all of the work to make these beads, but rather um, his wife and his potentially children as well. So, but that's not the end of the story when it comes to complicating this narrative of white-owned white, white -owned wampum factories. There's, there's, there's other things that add more wrinkles to the, to the narrative, and that is, if we look at the ledgers, we also see a man named Peter Sisko, who's buying conch shell and selling wampum. And when we, we also see him, his house is probably located here, just around the block, more or less. Uh, when we look up Peter Sisko in the 1850 census, we see that he's 31 years old, he's got a family of five, he's a male, and labeled as black by the census taker. His profession is also listed as wampum maker. So this was something that hadn't been studied about, the, about wampum making, and I had not, in all the previous literature, seen anything that references the potential for black wampum makers in the region. But I should note, too, that this area is relatively close to the Ramapo Mountains, and, it is, as a, and there's a history, of course, of, an, of indigenous populations that are labeled as black in the census records, or labeled as mulatto, so, you know, that's because the term Indian wasn't used in the census until later in the, se in the 19th century. So I don't, know, I don't know for sure how Peter Sisko would have identified, uh, but the census has suggested this is a black wampum maker, and an independent one at that, in the sense that, like David Campbell, goes to the store, buys the shell, makes the beads, and sells the beads back. So that's all happening before 1850. It also happens after 1850. But other things start to emerge uh, in the second half of the 19th century, and that is the process of industrialization. So we have cottage production, household-based production. Women are involved. 
We have independent black wampum producers. Uh, but around 1850, one of the Campbell descendants, actually one of the nephews of David Campbell, uh, built a two-story structure along the Pascat Brook and uh, found the, what becomes known as the Campbell Wampum Factory. They include a water wheel that powers four grinding wheels, so you no longer do you have to use your feet, but you can use hydraulic power. Uh, and they have a drilling machine, which can then be powered simply by a hand crank, so no longer do you have to use the build bow drill, uh, but you have this contraption that allows you to drill four beads at the same time. We also start to see new styles of beads that are being produced, including uh, Hair pipes, which is a style of bead that becomes iconic of the northern and southern plains region, as well as moons, which are these pendant shaped gorges here. And you can see representations of these uh, for you know, famous individuals in, in the West that actually wore these styles of beads. I don't have time, too much time to talk about those individuals, but I'm happy to do that in QA as well. Um, <clears throat> so, how do we think, how are we supposed to think about this factory? Uh, well, the other thing, in addition to hydraulic power for the grinding wheels and the hand-powered uh, drilling machine, we also see evidence of wage labor. And that is, uh, in ledgers associated with the Campbells, we see a man named James Williams who's paid $2 for grinding pipes. And when you look up James Williams, or it's not, I'm not sure exactly who James Williams is, but all of the last names of Williams in this area are either labeled black or mulatto in the census records. But we also see examples in the historical record, this newspaper article, for instance, that uh, there are people of color working the grinding stones. So when we look at this idealized representation of the interior of the factor, we have the protagonist in the center, probably one of the Campbells himself, uh, but behind him is, is, is sort of leaned, leaned over uh, someone that I like to think of as James Williams, who was, actually, uh, who was actually probably doing the majority of the labor of grinding at this place. So in many ways, aligns smoothly with other histories of capitalism, which is, oh, we go from a cottage industry into a factory setting, you introduce wage labor, accumulation of capital, and so on. What does the archaeologist, uh, what does the archaeology tell us about this? How do we think about Shell in this place as both a conscript to industrialization and as a defector to that project? Well, I looked at three different sites. The Campbell factory itself was excavated in 1924, and those uh, collections were spread out across like six different museums across the eastern seaboard, including Harvard University, where I first encountered it. And Stoltz Farm also was uh, previously excavated by the same amateur archaeologist in the early 20th century, and the museum collections had been previously unanalyzed. And then, as I mentioned, we were able to locate and do a, a, a survey of the David Campbell House. And you can see that the dates of these three sites are fitting a continuum from the late 18th to the early 19th to the late 19th century. And these two sites I'm interpreting as household-based production sites, and then the Campbell factory as an industrial one. So I've got five takeaways from the archaeological analysis. That is, takeaway one, at the David Campbell house, we found no evidence of hair pipes. That is significant because I expected to find hair pipes at this site. Uh, we know that hair pipes were in circulation at this time, and we know that David Campbell was an uncle of the four brothers who were manufacturing hair pipes, uh, but that wasn't happening at the David Campbell house. So for me, that suggests that the Campbell factory probably had uh, more of a monopoly over hair pipe making than I expected. Again, it fitting pretty well with histories of capitalist accumulation. Uh, we also know that at the David Campbell House, according to the uh, analysis of the debris and analysis of the ledgers simultaneously, we can estimate how many beads were being made per day and how many kilograms of product were being made per month. And that's 4.4 you know, kilograms of product per month of beads that were being exported. Uh, at the Campbell factory, we can do the same thing, which is 
also, when it, well, at least when it comes to hair pipes, not sure about wampum specifically, but, and it's a different style of bead, but if we convert, they're both made out of shell, and if we convert that to kilograms of product per month, the Campbell factory could produce up to twice as much, uh, twice as many beads as the David Campbell house. So here we can see this assemblage of technology and raw material and, uh, and knowledge of like of making wampum is assembling together here to facilitate industrialization in the, at this factory site. So uh, yeah, as I said, two times faster production at the Campbell factory. Um, the next takeaway here comes down to looking at ratios of different taxa. So, as I mentioned, wampum, purple wampum was made from conch shell or mercenaria mercenaria, and then at these sites, uh, white wampum was made primarily from um, conch shell. And if we look at these, this is also a track of, of, of change over time. So, at the Stoltz Farm site, another household cottage site, it's entirely made of quahog. It's the earliest site. Uh, the David Campbell house, however, you see much more conch shell than you do see wampum. And you see a similar ratio at the factory. So how do we interpret the fact that there's entirely wampum at one site and then becomes only 12%, or entirely purple wampum at one site and becomes 12% at the next site? Well, we know that purple wampum was still in demand from various records that, that reference, hey, we'd like, you know, we want this much purple wampum if you can make it. Um, but the problem is, and this comes from an interview with one of the Campbell, own, uh, Campbell factory owners, um, it was getting harder and harder to find large enough quahog shells for wampum production. If, has anyone had little necks around uh, here in the, in, the, in the New England area? They're little because they're younger, and the lip of, the, of, the, of a little neck is not thick enough to, make, to be able to make a, a purple bead. So for me, we have declining populations, or at least declining ratios of quahog in these assemblages, which we could interpret as the declining populations of older quahogs related to the emergence of new consumption regimes tied to an over-harvesting of younger clams, and so fewer of them are allowed to grow up. Um, so uh, the next takeaway here from the archaeological data comes from looking at ratios of debitage to wasters between the workshop, the household workshop, and the factory. So what I'm calling debitage here is basically routine waste. You have theoretically the same amount of uh, 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 broken bits of shell left behind, ideally, per bead that you make. If you don't make any mistakes, you'll, you would have the same amount of debitage from one bead to the next. Um, broken beads, however, ones that look like they were broken in the process of drilling, for me, I'm labeling as wasters here. So when you look at ratios of wasters to debitage, it's one way of thinking about, I don't know, efficiency, or I don't know, productivity, at least in the factory setting. Um, we can obviously debate about exactly what these ratios mean, but when we look at the ratios of wasters to debitage, at least as I've classified them, uh, we see very low ratios of uh, wasters to debitage at the household sites, and a much higher percentage at the Campbell factory, particularly for hair pipes. Now, hair pipes are longer, they're more difficult to drill, and that's probably what's, what's making some of this, uh, this data uh, a much higher percentage of, uh, at, at the, the Campbell factory, but at the same time, so this is, we have high breakage rates of hair pipes at the factory. At the same time, we also have testimonials that describe the drilling machine technology as this like wonderful invention <laughs> that was, that made it so there was infinitely less anxiety for the producers uh, who are using the hand crank. And then a later uh, oral history suggests that this, uh, this drilling machine led to an almost total elimination of waste. And I see, in fact, the opposite of that at, this, at the factory site when it comes to at least hair pipes specifically. 
Um, the last takeaway here when it comes to thinking this assemblage of appropriation of surplus value in the worker, in, in the factory setting here, is to think also again about the materiality of shell. So shell is made through a process of biomineralization, that is sea snails, that this, this conch shell that is a sea snail that uh, travels the sea floor. It absorbs calcium ions from its uh, watery environment and then it uh, it, it channels those ions and creates a durable polymer of calcium carbonate that is a shell, basically. That's how shell is made. And conch shell in particular is one of the most durable uh, biomineralized materials uh, on the planet, uh, which is also what makes it so effective here in production of beads. But if we look at this image, we can see that there's this spark that's happening from the conch shell as it's touching the grinding stone. And for me, when it comes to also like knowing a little bit and talking to indigenous, indigenous producers of wampum, the importance of um, wearing face masks when you're drilling and, uh, wampum in an industrial setting because it releases uh, calcium carbonate particulates into the air. <clears throat> so I'm actually able to calculate and estimate what those, percent, what those quantities of calcium carbonate per bead would be. So it's basically half a teaspoon of calcium carbonate per hair pipe, uh, which would, in this, knowing the size of the factory space, and oh sure, you know, there's a couple windows, but they're you know, probably closed. It's mostly taking place in the fall and the winter, or in the winter months. Um, so we can estimate the total quantity of shell dust that's in the air. We compare that to what is today the OSHA standard for like health regulations about uh, uh, calcium carbonate inhalation, and we see that the factory probably would have been 500 times over the OSHA limit for this. Um, so then keeping in mind too that this image is distorting the reality potentially of, this, of the experience of the factory, and in fact, probably the, the majority of bead grinders, and this was, the, this was the wage labor job, was bead grinding. It wasn't wampum maker. It was, you are no longer a wampum maker, you're a bead grinder. Uh, and, and these uh, workers would have been people of color, whether that's black, indigenous, you know, people labeled black and mulatto in the, in the census records, it's, it's difficult to know for certain, but the workers here definitely would have been at heightened risk of silicosis, which is a, a chronic, um, and fatal uh, lung disease where the passages of the lungs slowly basically get blocked over time. It leads to like a kind of like, depending on how bad it is, it can be, you know, a decade of slow suffocation until death. So it's in these places that the archaeology starts to, you know, rub up against and co contradict some of the historical accounts of the place. And so it reveals some of the reality of shell as it's being conscripted into this into this project of capitalist accumulation and eventually also being exported to the plains. But in the moment of production here, it is also, in terms of its calcium carbonate materiality, in terms of its breakability, it is also defecting from that process in complicated ways that have to do with the unseen agency and materiality of the shell itself. So, finally, the factory closed its doors around 1900. Uh, and it's at this time, in fact, that the Campbells themselves, they believed that the demise of their industry was in part due to the, quote, elimination of their consumer base. They just, they, in interviews, they described like, oh, you know, Indians don't have the taste for wampum like they used to. They're sort of describing uh, assimilation as the downfall of their, of their, of their industry because they just get fewer and fewer commissions into the, it, as the 19th century ro rolls on. In reality, hair pipes uh, remained popular uh, and remained an important signifier of indigeneity and an important sort of you know, way of citing sovereignty through adornment well through after the Civil War and into the reservation area, era um, and again, that's you know, another part of the project that I don't have too much time to talk about right now. But for me, this, what, what ends up happening, I guess, to the hair pipes in general is that a different company outcompetes the Campbell factory, a company that's based off of, out of the Chicago stockyards that's using the lower leg bones uh, of cows, uh, of cattle in general, to, to make hair pipes out of bone. And it 
bone materiality also that uh, that many of the indigenous consumers, quote unquote consumers of these objects, in fact prefer because bone is less breakable than shell. So again, another piece of the story of materiality that's woven into this historical narrative. And the factory then becomes a ruin. It is excavated only 20 years or so after it, it closes doors. I like to think of that as one of the first examples of contemporary archaeology uh, because it's just 20 years after the place became a ruin. Um, but it's, 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 it's that competition, that original ideology of market competition that they themselves described in competition with native producers that then they also see for themselves at the, at the turn of the 20th century. So speaking to themes of, of ruination and, and what is left behind, uh, that is historical archaeology, what is left behind in these ruins of capitalism uh, that we see today. So with that, I think that's time. Yes, more or less. Sounds good. Uh, but thank you so much. There's lots of people I could acknowledge, but um, here's just a short list for now. But thank you. All right, so we'll take questions for about uh, 10 minutes, um, and then we'll let folks go. We need to get to the next class and um, stay for a uh, longer discussion. So we'll do I'm currently trying to investigate cause of death for any of the people that might have worked in the factory. That's okay. just a very difficult thing because it doesn't I start to get well, formal. Super yeah, I, I, well, I, I mean, it's it's not necessarily. I still have yet to do that work fully. I've only scratched the surface, so it may still it may come up, but I you know didn't realize that was something I was going to have to look at until after I did the archaeological analysis. So it's, it's a great question. Yeah. I'm curious about the, um, the waster figure you got for, yes. the, um, for the, the work, the uh, workshop or the factory. Like, so of course, in classic archaeological theory factories, well, I guess it depends whether they're supposed to be more efficient or not. They're sort of pushing back against that. So there's the length of the bead as the variable. The bit, is there any difference in the bit or the way that the bead was supported in the factory setting? You mean the drill bit? Yeah, is the drill bit like made of a different material or something that? They're both, I think, iron at this time, I, I, I think. Um, the nature of the whole drilling like technology is completely different from the household versus the factory. So the factory is a, a complex contraption that it still exists existing today. But basically, you slide the beads into each of these spots here, and then you use a hand crank to like drill it. You also fill this with water and like dip it in to kind of clear out the boring hole. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, to compare and contrast that, of course, to the, the, the bow trail, you can only do one at a time here. You can do six at a time here. Um, but there's, a, I think, for me, a certain like attentiveness and skill that goes into the bow drill, which for me is like driving some of the, some of the differences here in breakage rates. Because that, so that one you're just pushing into your chest as a chest plate. It seems very intimate, that experience. You wouldn't want to break it. And here you're just doing like five at a time with the hand. Yeah, they say that, that the people. children of the family, the you know, grandkids okay. basically, are the ones operating the hand break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> so here maybe, I mean, the factory could have more material to waste. They have ample access yes. to it versus the household setting where they're a little more. Regardless of how much waste is being produced, they are still able to make twice as much product yeah. per month. Right. Right. So, but there's a more byproduct. Exactly. Both. Yeah. 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 There's also issues of archaeological. The, the context of excavation is, is complicated right. as well because the factory wasn't. Did they screen? Or they, the, there is an open question about how much they screened, yeah. uh, and, and because there's not a lot of details about the excavation. But the differences of what I've calculated, uh, which I had to do for. Had to do to defend this, uh, both in, in a peer-reviewed publication, which is now in historical archaeology, uh, but also for my dissertation. The, the, these ratios are so different that I would have to be missing, like, a huge amount of of of, of uh, debitage 
in order for that to even be comparable to this. Like the percentage of stuff that I'm missing in the museum collections here um, is, is quite significant. Like you'd have to lay like a huge percentage, I can't remember exactly the percentages of what's, what would have to be missing to make it comparable. Um, and I think it's telling too that this also was a site that wasn't, that was dug by the same person. Um, and we're a little more confident about how much was screened here. But it's significant that the, the ratios are similar for these two similar types of sites as well. But certainly debatable. Um, yeah, I guess just kind of jumping off of that, thought process in relation to materiality, I had, I guess, more so a question in relation to how you're defining agency and, like, the agent, because you, you can present it a bit, but I guess if you could, are you separating here and thinking about agency and intentionality, which I think you did discuss, but thinking about, like, the shell as an agent, the, the lack of intention behind that agency, if that makes sense? Yeah. I mean, you put it better than I have, but I think in some ways so far. Uh, yeah, it's a question simply of, I don't, I try not to get too in the weeds with sort of, uh, uh, sort of philosophical and theoretical distinctions between object agency, human agency, and stuff, but it's, it is something that you do have to reckon with a little bit. Um, and for me, it's like, I don't want to, in terms of historical narration, this is ultimately what I'm doing here. Um, Telling, narrating that history in a way that acknowledges human agency as something different than shell agency, um, but also not reducing the history to a series of intentions by human actors as well. So this is more about, this is the kind of like, oh yeah, there, there are unexpected interruptions to human projects that use shell. Uh, you know, we shouldn't necessarily valorize Shell as, a, you know, as some kind of heroic resistor of this process. Um, but you, the, and the, the same kind of process can be applied to when Shell goes into indigenous hands in the West. And the ones that are being made here, they also become part of, uh, shall we say, conscripts into projects of indigenous sovereignty as well, which is why I think it's useful because it, it, you can talk about Shell both in the, in the factory and on the plains, or as delegation photography, or as gifted in, in different intercultural, inter, intertribal exchanges, as being part of that project of human intention. But Shell's breakability is still complicating that story. How many hair pipe uh, 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 breastplates, you know, had broken beads along the way, you know, and that's partly why bone beads become more popular in the in the late nineteenth century. Does that help to? Yeah. So maybe I'll ask one last question. Um, I'm curious about the uh, rationale for the archaeological excavation of the David, I'm uh, sorry, of the, the Campbell factory, yeah. um, which you mentioned is 20 years following its closure, mm -hmm. which implies that the person doing this excavation would have been somebody who had maybe some memory of it, unless they're somebody <laughs> from outside of this area. And so I'm curious if you could just elaborate a little more on what made this person so interested in that particular site and topic. Yeah, I could go a lot of different ways with that question. First, the archaeologist that did it, he was from New Jersey, but not from Park Ridge, not from the town that the factory was in. So I think he was aware and of, of the factory um, as a place where wampum was made, um, but also was working with basically local historians that at that time were trying to enshrine the factory as part of the sort of industrial history of Park Ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the um, yeah, I mean, there were other factories that existed in that same town, and it's like, at a time where the landscape had been transforming in the one generation, maybe two, goes from a landscape of a entirely agrarian, uh, you know, farming landscape, that then a kind of rapid, like small scale workshops and then like industrialization that happens quickly and then like only 20 years after that, it becomes a suburban landscape. Commuters from New York City that are moving in to that region at the same time that the excavation is happening. So it's, I think for me, it's like that 
those dislocations of modernity, which is you know, so much time, so much things are ha happening at the same time, and like new new communities are moving into this 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 town, and also also Jewish community that's moving into the town in particular, um, that the people living there before are kind of desperate to like hold on to this history and then enshrine it as part of this local narrative. The the town logo or the town. Um, you know the little uh, logo. What is it? I don't know. Seal. Yeah, the seal and the and then the words that are under that seal is Oak Ridge. By industry, we flourish. So you know that's the, it's part of that story for sure. And local historians work with this archaeologists to make that happen. Cool. All right. So um, let's thank Eric. And again, anyone who wants to hang out and chat with more.